Morning's lesson is no creed but Christ. And we are in favor of Christ. With a lot of enthusiasm, we're in favor of Christ. Uh, we want to be like Peter. We want to be like Peter when Jesus said, Who do you say that I am that we will say thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God? Matthew 16, 16. We want to be like Martha. Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world, John 11. We want to be like Martha. We want to be like the eunuch. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So we are definitely in favor of Christ. We are in favor of the word of Christ as well. We are in favor of scripture, God's word. It is the final standard. Jesus said in John 12, verse 48, that the word that he spoke, the same will judge us at the last day. We are in favor of that word. In John chapter 6, verse 68, we want to be like Peter. We want to be like Peter when Jesus said, are you guys going to leave me too? Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so it's the only message that can give us spiritual life. His message contains all truth. Jesus himself said that the Holy Spirit was going to come. He was going to take a mind and give it to you, and he was going to guide you into all the truth. And so his word contains all truth. And his message is final. Jude would say near the end of the New Testament, to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. And so Jesus' word is all truth, and it's final, and it's authoritative, and it's all sufficient, and it will judge us at the last day. And it gives us everything we need. And so we were definitely in favor of his word. 2 Peter 1, 3, it's complete. He has given to us all things, the verse says, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Or as Paul would say of Scripture, all Scripture, every Scripture is inspired of God and profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And we are in favor of order as well. We are in favor of orderly worship. God said that all things be done decently and in order in the first Corinthian letter. And we are in favor of organized congregations with elders and deacons. Paul told Titus to set in order the things that are wanting to appoint elders in every church. And so we are in favor of order. And order is beautiful. Uh, order makes our roadways function, it makes our economy function, it makes our government function. It's no wonder, I suppose, uh, that in one of the most important aspects of our life, our faith, our religious beliefs, that years ago, people kind of had the idea, you know what, if we kind of took the Bible and could kind of take the Bible and streamline it and, and kind of make a list of the essentials of things, the essentials that you need to believe in, that would kind of make it very clear who was a heretic and who was a true believer if we would just kind of come along there and take the Bible and streamline it and make a list of essentials. These are the things that you need to believe and practice that that would be a pretty good idea. And I could see how people could think that. And it would be tidy and it would be orderly and it would be in Scripture. And in this lesson, I hope to kind of explain why. Now, when we talk about creeds, obviously we're not talking about class material, are we? I mean, obviously God is not against men taking his, his word and, and organizing it into booklets and class material. Or even writing a book on baptism or the qualifications of elders. God is certainly not against that or making the material age appropriate, like of the book of Genesis for six-year-olds or junior high class. In the book of Matthew chapter 28, we are commanded, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. We are commanded to teach people. We are commanded to instruct the members, so certainly God is not against us 
putting together booklets and tracks and books and class material and sermons and things like that on topics and on books and commentaries. God is not against that. But creeds are different, and I think everyone knows that. And I want to now explore that a little bit. First of all, the origins of creeds are interesting. In the New Testament, prior to baptism, we find individuals giving a confession of their faith in Christ, like the eunuch did in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. He was at, he, first of all, in verse 36, he said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. You know, I can't baptize someone who doesn't believe. And then he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so there we have an example of a confession. And Jesus talked about that. If you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. And Romans talks about that. Well, what started happening is that those baptismal confessions, or that confession prior to baptism, people started lengthening that and stretching that confession out and kind of making that into a doctrinal statement of all the things that you would need to believe prior to baptism. And those, those confessions, those confessions resulted in the Apostles' Creed, which would serve in the western part of the Roman Empire, and the Nicene Creed, which would serve in the eastern part of the empire, that you would need to confess that or adhere to that prior to anyone baptizing you. And that's kind of an interesting development, how something so simple as man tinkers with it and makes it more elaborate actually develops into an actual authoritative statement of faith. As far as defenses for creeds, and I can understand these defenses, I can understand where people are coming from. Many people thought that they would add stability to the church if we could take the essentials of Christian doctrine and, and just kind of have a list, that that's going to keep the church stable. Others, the idea was, well, it, will, it will make the Bible easier to understand. Instead of going to the Bible and having to read it, you can just read the creed, kind of like a, cliffs, a cliff notes. May I suggest to you that you look at creeds as like Wikipedia. Don't trust it. That's kind of the same way, that's kind of the same way a creed is. It's not the actual document. It's not the actual book. Maybe right, maybe dead wrong. It has zero authority with God. Just like certain things in college, if you quote certain sources, your teacher's going to throw that out because that has zero authority with the teacher. A creed has zero authority with God. Always remember that. He didn't write it. Okay. He did not write that. Uh, I think people thought that it's kind of a streamlined version of Scripture. You know, Christianity for busy people. I've, all, I've, always, I've always been bothered by stuff like that. Something for busy people. Hey, if that's really important, you're going to make the time to study that. All right? I'm also, ins I'm kind of insulted by books like something for busy people. You're not more busier than I am. You are not. None of us are more busier than anybody else. A defense, the big one was, it will provide a defense against error. It will keep everyone on the same page. Anyone who doesn't heed to the creed will be kicked out or will, will, will immediately be branded as a heretic. Yet, yet, the problem with all of that is Scripture was designed to do all of those. 1 Timothy 3.15, in case I'm delayed, I write. I write that you would know how, how a man should conduct himself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Paul says the letter of 1 Timothy was written so people would know how to behave themselves in the church or what to believe. Scripture was written to Scripture was written to give stability to the church. Scripture was written to be easy to under, be easy to be understood. Scripture may I suggest to you that Scripture is already streamlined. 
It doesn't need to be streamlined any further. Whatever is in Scripture is absolutely essential. And the verse for that would be, first of all, it would simply be the concept that God doesn't, God doesn't give any useless statements. That would be one thing, or useless truths. But the other one would be the passage we looked at and the passage quoted thus far. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all Scripture is inspired of God and, May I suggest to you the word and goes back to all scripture, or as one translation says, every scripture. Besides being inspired of God, what else is true of every single scripture? Every single scripture is profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. May I suggest to you the Bible has already been streamlined. Be very careful about going through the Bible and saying, ah, I don't need to read that. It's there for a reason. Another passage would be, second, oh, that's where we were, wasn't it? Okay, so there's our passage. May I suggest to you that there's a number of blind spots in creeds, and I, I certainly understand the mentality of the people who put creeds together. I understand where they were coming from. It's interesting, it's interesting as far as the systems that people have come up to try to keep unity and stability and, and, and freedom from error in a group. Uh, some groups, the way some groups do that is that, that every single congregation of that denomination studies the same material on every Sunday and every, on their weeknight meeting. Congregations are not allowed to kind of just kind of choose their own curriculum. That's the way some denominations try to keep unity. Every, every group will study the same thing on the same day, and it will, you will only use the material that we have published. Some groups do that. Some groups put a stamp or a seal on their books as far as these books are safe and everything in this book is truth. Some groups do that. Some groups have a very rigid authority structure. That's the way some groups do it. Other groups, other groups will say you can believe anything you want. That's the way they feel that they will keep unity. All you've got to believe is a couple of essentials or things that are considered essential. And so men have come up with all sorts of different ideas of how to preserve unity. Now, we know God's idea. God's idea is not any of that. God's idea is not an oppressive authority structure with all sorts of layers of human authority. God's, 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 God's method is not linking every congregation to a mother congregation. That wasn't God's idea either. In God's plan, every local congregation is ruled by its own elders. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Every local congregation is independent autonomous with its own elders. God's plan for unity is found in John chapter 17, 20, and 21. I do not ask in behalf of these alone, that is, just for the apostles, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. There's God's plan for authority. The document, the document that will be the standard, the document that we all must adhere to, will be the document that contains the writings of the apostles, their word. And that's the New Testament. That will be the only creed. The word creed means I believe, from the Latin I believe. The only creed that Christians will have, the only document that we will have that we must believe, will be the New Testament. That will be our creed. That's what we must adhere to, the New Testament. May I suggest to you that anything less than that or more than that, you're going to run into some blind spots. First of all, human creeds are not inspired no matter who put them together. None of the apostles put these, moder put these creeds to together that are out in the religious world. The apostles did not put those together. 
The apostles wrote the New Testament. Everything after that is uninspired. Creeds are often the product of compromise. That is, they contain the statement that most are willing to accept. By contrast, <laughs> uh, and I know sometimes we don't like this, but the truth of the matter is that God did not consult any of us before he wrote the Bible. God did not come along and say, hey, you guys, what would you guys like in the Bible? I'm going to write a book to you of how to live. What would you like in there? Uh, sorry, you guys, but God did not consult any of us. He didn't consult me. I know he didn't consult you. He didn't say, Jason, what would you like said about this or that? He didn't do that. Now, we might be kind of offended by that, that God asked for no input. God asked for zero input from us as far as on what's going to be in Scripture. We, we were not consulted. Uh, <laughs> he just simply had it written. As Jesus would say, thy word is truth. The Bible is not the product of compromise. The, product, the Bible is not a product of a convention or, or a council. It was not the product of any of that. God simply spoke. The Holy Spirit moved men to speak and write, and they wrote. And what was written was to be accepted by all men. Another blind spot. I think, and here's to me one of the most dangerous things about creeds, and this, is, this to me would be the big difference between a creed and like class material and commentaries and things like that. And that is, I think creeds make the mistake of thinking that man, that man can sum up in a list the essentials of Christianity. I think that's the big danger. You see, to me, the problem with that is if someone said, Mark, what are the essentials of the Christian faith? I would say, well, read the New Testament. That's it. The New Testament, that's the essentials of the Christian faith. I can't make it smaller than that because God didn't make it smaller than that. I mean, Jesus simply said, thy word is truth. All of it, all of his word is truth. For example, let me give you a couple of examples of places. First of all, in the book of Ephesians, you know, it, it, you, you could look at Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called, and one hope you were calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. I think a lot of people have gone to Ephesians 4 and said, well, that's a list of essentials. That's the essential things you must believe. But there's a problem. The problem with that is when you get to the phrase one faith, that's everything in your New Testament, one faith. Because the word faith there is not your individual faith. The word faith is the same word used in Jude 3, contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. The fa faith in that passage is the things that Christians believe and practice. But that's everything in your New Testament. And so you might think Ephesians 4 is 4 through 6 is kind of a small list. No, it's a very big list. Because in that list is one God, but there's a lot of doctrines about God. And one Lord, but there's a lot of doctrines about Christ. His nature, his second coming, his atonement. It says one hope, but that brings in a lot of things about heaven. It says one baptism, but there's a lot of aspects of baptism. Who is it for, the mode, etc. So that's a, a lot bigger category there than people think it is. Not only that, but you could, you could adhere correctly to one baptism and still end up lost if you don't have any self-control. Let's go a little farther. Um, Jesus was asked to sum up what is the great commandment in God's law. And it's interesting how he answered that. In Matthew chapter 22, and in verse 36, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? How did Jesus respond to that? Basically, he presented two commands or two principles that included everything in God's law. 
He would say you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul.